questions. So the talk is given by Jan Kunisch, now from the Technical University of Vienna. Please. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to start by thank you to the organizers for inviting me to this uh, workshop and uh, also thank the chairman and the previous speaker for introducing the method. So <clears throat> my talk will be about calculation of dynamical susceptibilities with uh, dynamical mean field theory. Our main motivation was to actually test the method, but usually you want to use it on some physically interesting problem. So I will, I will use a dynamical mean field theory and a calculation of the susceptibilities within this method to study the excitonic, excitonic magnetism. And I will explain a little bit what excitonic magnetism is. Uh, let me start by acknowledging the, the people that contributed uh, to this work. So most of the results I'm going to show you were obtained by my postdoc, Dominique Jefcoa. And the other people that contributed are Atsushi Ariki, also postdoc in my group, and the PhD students uh, in groups of Karsten Held and, and uh, Giorgio San Giovanni, Josef Kaufmann, Patrick Gunacker, and Andreas, Andreas Hauswell. So um, my talk will be mostly about models, but let me start by uh, motiva motivating the, the, the work by looking at materials. And the first material I want to point out is uh, lantern cobaltate. What is, what is excitonic magnetism about in lantern cobaltate? Well, excitonic magnetism is a magnetism of uh, materials where the ground, atomic ground states are non-magnetic. That sounds very boring, but what makes it interesting is that the excited state, the atomic excited states, carry a magnetic moment, and if these atomic excited states are not very high in energy, it may lead to interesting effects. And so in lantern cobaltate, the ground state is a non-magnetic low spin state of cobalt 3 plus, but the excited states are called either intermediate spin state carrying spin 1 or high spin state carrying spin 2, and these are usually treated as uh, just atomic excitation, ex just crystal field excitations of atoms. What we've suggested and what our experimental colleagues observed recently is that these atomic excitations are not actually atomic. They are, they are mobile. They have for us a large dispersion. And you can see here the results of uh, Rick's uh, LX measurement, these, uh, these experimental points, on top of the contour plot, which is, uh, which is theoretical prediction. And you see this is, the, this is the dispersion of our exciton. It's quite sizable. It's of about half an electron volt. Well, another material which is, uh, which is of, of great interest to us is another cobaltate compound or a family of compounds, prosthodimum cobaltates. The, this family of compounds exhibit a, a phase transition between uh, 60 and, and 130 Kelvin. And there are lots of experimental data that suggest that this phase transition can be understood in terms of condensation of the excitons. I don't want to go through all of these. I just want to, sh I, I just want to point out that there are a number of, of experiments which, which are consistent with this picture. However, we don't have a really a smoking gun, an experiment that, would, that could um, specifically probe the condensate or tell us this is an excitonic condensate. It cannot be explained by any other uh, physical theory. So uh, one of the questions I want to um, ask in my talk and provide an answer to is how can we detect an excitonic magnet with today's uh, experimental techniques? And the other, the other question is how does mean field theory perform in phases with long range order with spontaneously broken symmetry? Questions like do we, do we observe Goldstone modes? What about Higgs modes? And some other uh, fancy names that one can, one can sell papers with. Okay, so uh, what is our model? The model we want to study is uh, the simplification of the real material instead of uh, T2G and EG band of real cobaltates. We will have just two bands, which we, we will call A and B. So we will study a two orbital Hubbard model on a square lattice. You can think about it as, uh, let's say, XY and X squared minus Y squared orbitals. We will consider nearest neighbor hopping, which is primarily diagonal between the orbitals of the same type, but we will also include the effect of cross-hopping between orbitals of different type. And we will include a, a local Coulomb interaction, 
with the uh, wound scuppling, which is ferromagnetic, which is an important part of, uh, of our problem or model that we want to study. The method we are going to use is dynamical mean field theory, and you have already heard about it. So I, I just uh, want to make, uh, well, dynamical mean field theory can be understood from many different, different perspectives. The perspective I want to point out that we can understand it as, as an effective method. Dynamical mean field theory provides us an auxiliary problem which uh, allows us to calculate the irreducible vertices of many body theory. So the common use is to calculate the one particle irreducible vertex, which is a self energy, but we can also calculate the two particle irreducible vertex, which then give, uh, gives us access to a two particle response to, to susceptibilities, which are typically more experimentally relevant quantities or more commonly studied experimentally. To, to calculate these two particle response functions, what we do technically is to solve two beta salpeter equations. We start with the impurity problem where we obtain the two particle correlation function and the one particle propagators, and we solve this beta salpeter equation to get the two particle irreducible vertex, and then we take it and plug it into the lattice problem and we solve this lattice beta salpeter equation to get the, the physical two particle um, susceptibility. So let me make a f just, just a few technical points. So in this approach, we, we have the full frequency structure. So we have the, the bosonic frequency and two fermionic frequencies. What is simplified is, is, the, is the k space structure, or it's better to, to, to say it in the real space, our vertex is purely local, so it's sitting on on one atom. Our approach is multi-orbital and we impose no symmetry constraints, which allows us to go to uh, phases with, with broken symmetry. The, technically, the implementation is, is performed in a Matsubara representation, and so we have to perform analytic continuation at the end to get uh, uh, real uh, physical quantities in, in real physical, <clears throat> physical frequency. So let me, let me make a few remarks about the model. So this is the phase diagram, kind of the, the um, general phase diagram of two-band Hubbard model studied by, by many people, where we have uh, crystal field splitting on one axis and the interaction strengths on the other axis. In the right uh, low corner, when, when the crystal field dominates, we get, uh, at, this is all at half filling. So at half filling, when the crystal field dominates, we get a band insulator. When the interaction dominates, we get a mod insulator, which would be described by S1 Heisenberg model. And in the, in the wedge where the, where the bandwidth or hopping is, is, not, is comparable with the other, other two, uh, two parameters, we get a metallic phase. But uh, this model is actually much more interesting. When you allow for, uh, for long range ordering, of course, the, the high spin, uh, so, so the, the, the high spin mod insulator would form a Heisenberg anti ferromagnet. The anti ferromagnetic phase could extend into the metallic phase, but we can also get phases like a spin state order, which would be a lattice decorated by high spin, low spin, high spin, low spin. Or we can get an S1 excitonic condensate, which is the phase I'm actually going to talk about. And so I will tell you more, more about it in a moment. And the results I'm going to show you fall into this region. So we will, we will use the crystal field splitting as a parameter. We will be close to the spin state crossover where low spin and high spin are um, approximately balanced in energy. And we will introduce another direction which will be the temperature, which will, you can think about as, as perpendicular direction, direction here. So this is, a, this is the actual phase diagram calculated by changing a crystal field so what we have here is the normal phase, the low spin, and then we have the excitonic condensate. So let me explain what this, try to briefly explain what the excitonic condensate is. And I think the most intuitive picture is to use the strong coupling picture, where, where we think in terms of the atomic states, the low spin state and the high spin state. You can think about the low spin state as a vacuum. So a lattice full of low spin states can be viewed as vacuum. And the high spin state, which comes in three species because it's S1 state, can be viewed as an excitation. And because of uh, processes like, 
like this one, these, these excitations are not, are not uh, uh, locked on the atom, but they can move through the lattice. And that's why they can, they can condense. Essentially, both Einstein condense. And then they form a state which can be approximately described by a wave function, which is just a product wave function where we have the combination of low spin and some high spin on each atomic side. So this, this, would, be, this, would, be a, this would be a state uh, which we would call a polar condensate. The condensate can come, can come in many different, uh, different uh, symmetries because we, have, because we still have the degree of freedom of, uh, of uh, the high spin states. What, what is actually realized in our model is, is so-called uh, polar condensate, where, we, uh, where the uh, s equal 1 s, uh, and s equal minus 1 states have equal weights. So this state has no, no ordered moment, but it still breaks the spin rotational symmetry. Well, we are not doing a bosonic theory. We are doing actually numerics for, a, for the Hubbard model, which is fermionic theory. So we have to look at fermionic observables. The broken symmetry can be detected, detected for example, by looking at this spin triplet combination of orbital of diagonal expectation value, which is uh, if we have this, the original symmetry of the Hamiltonian, this should be zero by symmetry. If we go to the ordered phase, phase this uh, order parameter acquires a finite, uh, finite expectation value. Before I go to the results, let me make one more remark about the symmetry of our Hamiltonian. So the Coulomb interaction that we use is actually so-called density-density form of the Coulomb interaction. So this Coulomb interaction has uh, only uh, the, the, the spin symmetry of this interaction is, the, is a uniaxial symmetry. So we have U1 spin rotation. So this is, this is the symmetry we have always in our model. And then when we put this cross hopping to zero, we have one additional symmetry, which is a gauge, gauge invariance with respect to this, to this gauge transformation. Basically, it reflects the fact that the A charge and B charge are conserved separately. So we cannot convert an A electron to a B electron with, uh, if this term is, is missing. And why am I pointing this out? Well, the, the broken symmetries, and both of these symmetries, this U1 times U1 in this case, and the U1, in this case, are broken at the excitonic transition. And as you know, the number of broken symmetries or the type of broken symmetries determines the nature of the Goldstone modes in your, in your ordered phase. So one of the questions, a big, basically the main reason we did this study was to see, do we get these corresponding Goldstone modes with, with dynamical mean field theory or not? So these are the results. And let, let me just quickly flash the one particle spectra. Basically, the one particle spectra are pretty boring. So what we have here is, again, the cartoon of the phase diagram. And if, if we move along this line, if we drive the transition by reducing the crystal field, we go from this, uh, this band structure to this band structure. We have always gaps. So on one particle level, there is not much interesting happening. And the gap is actually pretty large. It's about 0.3 in these, in these units. But if you look at the two-particle level, it's, it's much more interesting. So what, what, what is shown here? Each of the rows is one point in this phase it, along this line. So going from top to the bottom, we are reducing the crystal field. Here is the phase transition. So the, the upper two rows correspond to the, to the normal phase. The lower rows correspond to the ordered phase. The first, the first column is just a spin-spin correlation function. So this is what you would call a, a dynamical uh, spin structure factor. The other four columns are excitonic susceptibilities. So I don't want to go into details, but you can imagine we can, uh, we can uh, take these expectation value and calculate them in different spin directions. So this is the x and y. It corresponds to, uh, to spin direction. And we can make, make them in a symmetric or anti-symmetric combination, or you can also call it a density-like or current-like combination, or we started to call it real and imaginary, so we call it R and, and I. So these are some kind of excitonic susceptibilities. So these are matrix elements of our, of our susceptibility matrix. 
And what is shown here is the dispersion. So this is a, a, a cut through a Brillouin zone, through a two-dimensional Brillouin zone from gamma to X to M to gamma. So what you see in the upper line is the dispersion of our exciton. Indeed, in, in our fermionic calculation, when we calculate the susceptibility, we see the dispersion of an exciton. When we reduce the crystal field, the excitonic gap goes down, and at the transition, the gap is closed. And you see in the normal phase, all these, all these uh, pictures are the same. These, uh, these modes are degenerate. As we proceed down to the, to the ordered phase, we see the development of the two Goldstone modes. You see one Goldstone mode here, and this one is associated with breaking of the, of the spin, spin rotation symmetry. And there is another Goldstone mode here, which is associated with the breaking of, of, this gauge, of this gauge symmetry. And uh, you can extract the, the sound velocities and show that these sound velocities are indeed different. And uh, the, also the linear regime of these, of these different Goldstone modes is, uh, is different. So the first, the first question we ask, do we get a Goldstone mode? And does it correspond to the general expectations from the general theory based on the symmetry breaking. Yes, we observe these Goldstone modes even with our numerical, numerical implementation. Now let us, let us remove one of the symmetries. So let, let us switch on this cross-hopping and remove the gauge symmetry. What happens now? So again, going in the same direction, uh, we see the, the Goldstone mode associated with the spin rotation is still there, but the other, the other mode that, is that was associated with the, with the phase, uh, phase uh, rotation is now gapped. And if you, if you can extract the value of this gap for different values of this, of this uh, hopping parameter, and you see in the normal phase the gap closes, it depends on the crystal field, it does not really depend on, on V, but in the, in the ordered phase, this is, this is how, the gap, uh, how the gap opens. So, so we get uh, something what, what could be called a Higgs gap. It is a gap that is closed exactly at the, at the phase transition and then opens again when we go into the ordered phase. But there is something else that, that is quite interesting about this mode, namely where the spectral weight lives. And let me, let me show you the, the same picture in a zoom when zooming around the gamma point. So again, here we, have the, here we have the normal phase. Here we go into the ordered phase, and we see that uh, if we are close to the phase transition, the main spectral weight lives in this, uh, in this column. The order parameter here is point, it's a vector in the, in the space of, uh, of spin direction and also in the, in the space of this phase phase variables, so the, uh, the, the order parameter is, uh, is imaginary and pointing along the y-axis, and the response here is exactly, uh, or this element describes the response to the field pointing in the same direction. So this, this response is amplitude response. We apply a field which is pointing along the order parameter, and we ask how does the order parameter respond? And we see that this, is, this, is, this can be called an amplitude mode or amplitude fluctuation. But as we proceed into the ordered phase, this amplitude mode loses its spectral weight and it moves to what was originally the Goldstone mode. So if, if V was zero, the, the Goldstone mode, which went all the way to, to, uh, to zero frequency, was sitting in this, in this uh, direction or in this, in this matrix element. So what do we see here is what we can call a gapped Goldstone mode. So what, what is happening? Well, this situation, by the way, is very common. If you, if you take a magnetic material where you have uh, some magnon dispersion and you introduce some, uh, uh, some uh, magnetocrystalline anisotropy due to, uh, due to spin orbit coupling, you open a spin gap. This would be a precisely that kind of gap. So what is, what is controlling where, is, where the spectral weight lives? Well, it is, the, it is the relative strength of the Weiss field. So we have two symmetry breakings here. We have a symmetry breaking which we, which we placed uh, explicitly into the Hamiltonian, 
and a symmetry break which appears spontaneously. If the spontaneous symmetry break in represented by the vice field dominates over the explicit symmetry break in, well, we get this gap Goldstone situation. But if we have, if the explicit symmetry break in dominates over the vice field, well, we get a, a real amplitude, real amplitude response, something what you would normally call a Higgs mode. So uh, in the rest of my time, let me go back to the question, how do we, how do we detect, how can we detect the excitonic condensate and uh, go back to, to what I already show you and focus now on the first column. So this is the, this is the spin structure factor. This is something that you can routinely measure with, with inelastic neutron scattering. And you can observe something interesting. In the normal phase, there is absolutely no response. Well, that's not surprising because what you essentially have is a band insulator, which has a gap much larger than the temperature scale, so there is nothing really that can be magnetically active. But as you proceed into the ordered phase, well, you get rather sharp, sharp kind of dispersion with increasing weight. And if you look carefully, you perhaps notice that there is a similarity between this spectra and this spectra in this column. And this, this, is not, this is not a coincidence. This has actually a very simple explanation in terms of the strong coupling, strong coupling picture. So if we go back to our bosonic picture, the, uh, the magnetic moment along the z direction has just this simple representation, right? It's the number of, of excitons with, with s equals 1 minus the number of excitons with s equals, to, equals minus 1. But the, but the natural, natural um, representation that, that we use in polar condensate is to use the XY representation. So if you go to the Cartesian representation, the, uh, the, the spin moment has this, uh, has, this, uh, has this form. Now in the condensate, one of these operators acquires a finite expectation value. So you can replace it with a number. And in this case, it is an imaginary, it's pointing in the Y direction and it is imaginary. So if you put imaginary number here, you find that in the, in the ordered uh, phase, the SZ operator is proportional to this DRX operator, and that's why their susceptibilities are proportional to each other. The proportionality con constant is the order parameter. So that's why there is no coupling in the normal phase, but in the ordered phase, there is a clear coupling, and we can see the fingerprint of the condensed excitons in the spin structure factor. So uh, before I run out of time, let me show you how th that we can observe a similar behavior when we drive the, the transition thermally. So now we are moving along this, uh, along this line. Down in, in the normal phase, now we have some magnetic response. Why? Because at high temperature, we excite some of the high spin states, but they, are, they do not form condensate. So they, they basically respond like isolated, weakly interacting high spins. So you see, uh, a featureless in, in the reciprocal space response localized at very low frequencies. But as we cool down and, and go into the ordered phase, well, this, this picture changes qualitatively and eventually we get this sharp, sharp transition uh, or sharp dispersion with, with a large gap uh, away from, from the gamma point. And this is something what, which was actually recently observed in inelastic uh, neutron scattering experiment in one of these uh, prosidium cobaltate materials. This, is, this was a pretty difficult experiment to interpret because there, are big, uh, there is a big effect from the prosidium uh, ions which has to be subtracted. But nevertheless, they claim, and they could base on their, uh, their, their data, uh, conclude that indeed they see that uh, away from the gamma point, when, you, when, when one cools down through the transition temperature, a gap opens in the, in the response, uh, in, this, in this spin response. So uh, this takes me to my conclusion. So the answers of the, to the questions I posed at the beginning, how, how to detect uh, an excitonic magnet? Well, we show that there is a qualitative change in the dynamical spin structure factor that can be used as a fingerprint of this excitonic condensate, I should stress that this is not, this is not a magnon. There are no ordered moment. There is, there is no moment pointing in any direction in this, in, this, uh, in this condensate. Nevertheless, we see 
almost magnon-like dispersion, which, however, vanishes, its spectral weight vanishes very close to the, to the gamma point. There is, of course, still a possibility to observe the excitons directly with, with methods like uh, RICS, but uh, the resolution of RICS is probably not enough, and also the, the uh, uh, RICS at L edges of transition metals cannot probe the full brilliant zone because of, uh, because of uh, momentum, momentum constraints. Uh, the second question, how does uh, dynamical mean field theory perform in phases with long range order? So I showed you that the Goldstone theorem is fulfilled and that actually to rather high accuracy we can detect actually a small symmetry breaking already leads to opening of a, of a detectable, uh, detectable gap. And we, we uh, started as a byproduct of this, of this investigation the crossover from a Goldstone, gap Goldstone mode to a Higgs amplitude mode as a function of the relative strengths of the symmetry break-in term and of the Weiss field that creates this spontaneous symmetry break-in in our system. Thank you for your attention.